Thank you very much, Jez. So, so as you said, um, today I'm going to talk to you about making good ideas happen. So how we can turn the, the cutting edge scientific insight from behavioral science actually into real world products, services, ideas, campaigns. And this was the, the thinking behind the Behavioural Design Lab. So we launched in November 2012 um, a partnership between Warwick Business School at the University of Warwick and the Design Council, a charity in London. Um, so Warwick has um, probably the leading centre for behavioural science in Europe. The Design Council are a charity that champions great design to improve lives. And broadly, our mission was to use a scientific understanding of people to design better product services and places that change behaviour and improve lives. But really, I mean, everyone has their boilerplate, but really what we are is creative problem solvers. And I think something that's come out of this um, event already today is actually a lot of the work that we do is about taking complex problems and trying to turn them into something real life and really exciting. So what I want to talk to you about today is, is simply how, how do you go from that point at which you have a really, really strong insight and actually turn it into something very, very tangible. And this just reiterates Dan's point. The first place that we always start with is people. So it's out on the ground, really understanding the types of lives that people want, what they experience, what they feel, what they do on a daily basis. This isn't so that we can think about, well, what can we sell them? Or how can we give them a particular product? How can we force a particular policy or get them to comply with something that we want them to do? It's about truly understanding what people motivate, what, what really is important within their lives. And then we can think about designing products and services about actually improving their lives. This doesn't necessarily mean that we're against things like um, new commercial revenues. The whole point is it's about revealing new opportunities to solve these particular problems. And by focusing on people, you can begin to find, I guess, more lateral ideas. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about those principles, how in the work that we do, we go from people actually into products and services. So we come uh, across a lot of companies that they say they know what the problem is, but they've almost got too much insight. What they don't know is why it occurs. They don't know what to make. They don't know what to do next. And more importantly, they don't know what works. So if they have things going on, they don't know actually how to compare between the things that are working, what's not working, how they can improve what they have. So we often call the first step the fog of uncertainty, this a position where you, you almost have this really, really strong insight about what you think the problem is, but you don't know where to go next. You're almost kind of uh, stumbling around in this uncertainty. And this is where we believe behavioral insights can be incredibly powerful. And this is also where the, the kind of partnership between design and behavioral science is a very par uh, powerful partnership. Design is all about understanding who and what. Who are the people that we're trying to benefit? Behavioral science can help you take that first step from knowing what into knowing why, helping you understand why a particular problem occurs. You can then use those two areas of research to help you focus down on particular opportunity areas, knowing what to do next, knowing what to make. And then through the use of things like experimental methods, you begin to know actually generally what works. We often challenge the first question. So as uh, Paul was just saying, actually, clients often come to that saying, no, 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 we know what the problem is. This is what we want. This is the product we want. This is the technology we want. And actually, it's often our job to push them back and say, well, do you truly understand the people? Or are you making assumptions about what they want? How much have you actually gone back out there and understood reality? We always frame our projects in terms of improvement. So taking that first step, once you maybe understood what the problem is, and you begin to tease out opportunities because you've understood why certain problems occur, how then can you progress into creating things for people? So these are the, the four of the, the questions that we're currently working on at the Behavioral Design Lab. So how can we improve the health and well-being for children under five? This is about creating community engagement. How can we ensure that we can help people help themselves? There's plenty of good ideas out in the community, but how can we help people take control of their lives and actually make life better for themselves and their families? How can we improve the experience of giving and receiving care? This isn't about how can we get staff to comply with the rules that we've set. This is about how can we improve the well-being of staff? How can we build the strongest possible relationship between uh, carers and their customers to ensure the best quality of care? How can we improve comfort at home while reducing alcohol consumption? The alcohol message is always the same. Drink less. Take days off. But actually, if you get down to what people generally want, people want to relax, people want to socialize, people want to be with other people. So how can we actually help improve that experience and maybe secondarily reduce how much they're drinking? And finally, how can we improve comfort at work 
while reducing energy consumption in the workplace. So it's exa exactly that same principle, which is we don't want to go about enforcing people or, or almost manipulating people into doing things because we believe there is some kind of um, goal in terms of energy reduction. We start from the point of view of, actually, how can we help people feel relaxed at work? If they're opening the window because they want some fresh air, we shouldn't force them to shut that window. We should actually think about how can we create a more relaxing environment for those people in the work. And at the heart of all of these ideas and at the heart of all of the work that we do, it's about helping people help themselves. So really underlying uh, the work between behavioral science and design is not only do we need to understand how and why people behave the way they do, but we need to use those insights to guide and support people in making better decisions. So we believe that lots of people have good intentions. There's all of these intentions. I know I maybe want to live a healthier life. Maybe I want to cut down on alcohol. Maybe I want to, to have a different diet. But actually, that isn't the problem. The problem is taking those practical steps. And where are you going to find those ideas? You're going to come from the people that actually are having those problems. Ideas come from problems. We don't start by thinking about a behavioral hammer and going around looking for nails. We start by understanding what people want and understanding what experience we want to improve. So these are all projects that we're currently working on, R&D projects that have started from research with people, things like observation, ethnography, interviews, really understanding people's experiences, and then looking to behavioral literature to understand, well, why did that particular experience occur? They won't be able to tell us. We don't rely on self-report. So how can we use those cutting-edge insights from behavioral science to help us reveal opportunities and actually stimulate new ideas for these types of people, from these types of people? So one of the, the big projects that we're currently working on, in, in the top left, improving the health and well-being of children under five, is a partnership between the Design Council, uh, Guys and St. Thomas's Charity, and the London boroughs of Southwark and Lambeth. And they came to us right at the beginning, just very broadly saying, we want to improve public health outcomes in, in Southwark and Lambeth. It was a fantastic brief for us. It was, we broadly know that design, behavioral science, all these kind of creative problem-solving approaches can help us uncover radical new ways of creating ideas from the community. So we went out, we did a lot of work um, within those communities, and we focused down on, on three different briefs to do with reducing stress and anxiety, um, getting families out of the home, and increasing physical activity and play. And then, it, rather than turning within ourselves, thinking, right, well, let's come up with some ideas, we thought, well, the best ideas have got to come from those communities. So the work that we do, uh, kind of around the principles of design challenges, is we put out open innovation competitions. So we put out open calls, and we say, right, here are the briefs, here are the point of opportunities, here's a boundary in which you can work, give us some ideas. So we, uh, we had hundreds of applications, uh, we did a funneled approach, um, so we started off funding 20 and supporting 20, and have begun to reduce it down over time. And we're currently funding and supporting six different teams, all of whom have this exactly common aim, improving health and well-being of children, but all have come about it from a completely different point of view. So there's pop-up parks, um, who are disruptive play spaces in urban areas. There's Kids Connect, uh, an app for um, helping families find their local uh, services. Creative Homes, which is a cross between super nanny and changing homes. Uh, crafty Explorers, who uh, ways of improving physical play and activity. The Good Enough Mums Club, which is one of my favorites, they're all my favorites, is um, a musical for mums, so helping people empathize with, with going through motherhood, and Easy Peasy, um, which is uh, products to help child development. So these are all fantastic ideas, and the hero here isn't behavioral insights. The hero is these entrepreneurs, these innovators, these parents, these charities that have come up with these fantastic ideas. And where I believe behavioral science can be really powerful is helping get these ideas off the ground, actually making good ideas happen. So we're now working with each of these six teams to help them better understand actually who the people are that they're trying to help. We're also helping them set up and run very simple experiments. Each of these different teams come from very different backgrounds. Kids Connect is two mothers on maternity leave who just had a fantastic idea. Easy Peasy is a partnership between Save the Children and Character Counts. Good Enough Mums Club, again, parents who are entrepreneurs. Crafty Explorers, um, a group of uh, guerrilla geographers. They've all come from back different backgrounds. They all have very different um, research understandings, but we've helped them experiment. Kids Connect, this blew my mind, run a, a randomized controlled trial with a paper prototype of their app in a children's center. It was absolutely fantastic. Pop-up parks, we're currently heading them set up, um, helping them set up a, a controlled experiment in, in Southwark and Lambeth. Um, easy peasy, or digital, so we can uh, help them with some A-B testing. The hero here is the idea. 
behavioral insights is the, is the platform for those ideas. And that's why, from the behavioral design lab point of view, we believe behavioral science must always kind of be paired with the creative industries. Research alone will not solve these problems. Research paired with other creative industries, creative problem solving. We actually begin to not even call ourselves necessarily behavioral scientists or designers with creative problem solvers. We don't just use those two things. We draw on a whole range of different areas of expertise. So we pull this all together uh, using what we call the, the double diamond, which is um, a, a framework developed by the Design Council back, back a, a few years ago, and it pulls together the, the kind of divergent and convergent stages of the design process. So how you go from that vision early, so how you go from that, that really strong interest in people and actually turn it into a proven working concept at the end. So it's about that first stage of discovery, actually going out and understanding what people's experiences are. Second step is about defining those opportunity areas. So how can we use insights and methods from behavioral science to help us focus down? So once we've got that huge amount of insight, actually how can we turn it into a tangible brief that can be then used as a platform of creative ideas? The next step is development. And we're really strong believers in open ideas, open innovation. The best ideas don't come from six people sitting in a brainstorm. The best ideas come from the people that are actually experiencing these problems on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why we always try and get the most collaborative teams applying to our, to, our, to our work. We don't make any kind of stipulations about the types of people, the types of organizations that we want to come and work with. We just say, look, here's the brief, here's the opportunity. Come to us with your ideas. And then delivery. How can you deliver solutions that work? This is a risky process. We often start this process having absolutely no idea of what the solution is going to be at the end. We have to be able to help clients and organizations manage that risk as they go along. And this is why experiments can be such a powerful tool. We set up and run very, very simple um, experiments with these teams. Small sample sizes, but they do help us test proof of concepts. And one of the, the most important, I think, facts about experiments is they're not necessarily about proof. They're about improving. So the way that we frame it to our teams is that experiments aren't there to, to give you that rubber stamp of this thing works, this thing doesn't work. It's not a dirty word like research and evaluation. You often get that kind of um, slightly depressed look across people's faces. Experiments are there to help you improve your ideas and actually create something that works within the community. So they can help us narrow down on what that solution may be. So throughout this process, we believe it's actually really a, it's a creative problem-solving process. It's not necessarily about just using behavioral science. It's about actually combining all of these different worlds and different backgrounds into a, a process that can turn a really, really strong vision about people's experience. How do we want to improve people's lives? And turning it into really, really tangible products and services that are out on the market. Fundamentally, this is about turning problems into opportunities for enterprise. So those six teams, these are all businesses. They are all actually coming up with sustainable ideas. These are all ideas that won't necessarily rely um, on public funding, on grant funding, in the long term is the hope. These are ideas that hopefully begin to alleviate pressure on things like the state. So we believe that actually through this type of process, you can find new revenue streams, you can find new commercial products, new commercial services that both have a common business aim, but also a very strong social purpose aim. And that is... I guess at the heart of our work, we ensure that everything that we do has that social purpose at the heart of it, but we also work with all types of sectors, recognizing that actually the best ideas are those that are going to be sustained in the long term, which means necessarily they will need to make money. So how do I think we should make good ideas? Well, th these are my four tips. Start with people and success will follow. That's always got to be the case. And don't start with people in terms of how can I sell them this product or how can I get them to comply with this policy. Start with, people think, start with thinking, actually, what do people want? How can I improve the lives that they live within? No insight without action. Insights won't save the world. Ideas save the world. Insights are the things that can help us get there, but actually, fundamentally, it's good ideas that are going to actually change the world we live in. Help people help themselves. We believe in guiding and supporting people in making better decisions. We don't necessarily define what good looks like, but we help people realize those good intentions. And finally, experiment to improve. It's not about proof, it's about improvement. Your ideas and ideas should always be improving. Experiments can help you demonstrate that proof of concept um, in lieu of longer term measures. So these uh, are, my, are my kind of, I guess, four points for how you can make good ideas happen. And fundamentally, at the heart of them, is that we believe if we're going to tackle many of these social problems, then actually you have to put people and society at the heart of business. Thanks very much.